There you go. Good boy. So, I'm out here walking Charlie. Good chance to talk about the Reno Benteen Defense Site. It's named after Major Marcus Reno and Captain Frederick Benteen. Now, Major Reno, well, he's a bit of an odd duck. He had a pretty good service record in the Civil War. Uh, got breveted, got awarded uh, honorary ranks a few times. Uh, back in 74, uh, his wife died. Leaves him with a teenage son. And Reno's going through some difficulties. Starts drinking a lot. Well, he's kind of alienated himself from all the other officers in the unit. Now, the other guy the site's named for is Captain Frederick Benteen. You know, he's an odd duck, too. He's born in Virginia. Uh, his dad, pro-Confederacy. Uh, when the Civil War kicks off, Benteen joins the Union Army. Didn't go well with his family. Throughout the war, Benteen feels like the fact that he's a Southerner might be held against him. So, Benteen actually gets a pretty decent chip on his shoulder. The thing about a lot of these Civil War uh, officers is they got egos. And they got big egos. He big on the drama. Talks a lot of trash, a lot of smack with the other officers, about other officers. He's got nicknames for different officers. The Little Bighorn fight is going to make or break his legacy. Put it that way. Afternoon, June 25th, 1876. Major Marcus Reno has just attacked the Indian village and uh, unsuccessfully. And so his men are doing a little retreat. One of the first people to die on the east side of the river, a fellow by the name of uh, Lieutenant Benjamin Hodgson. He gets shot close to the river and then uh, grabs a neighboring trooper's stirrup and is pulled the rest of the way across. And then they find his dead body on the east side of the river. So uh, if you look today across the river, you'll see his uh, marker all by itself out there. So as Reno's men are trickling up the ravines on the east side of the river, up towards the top of the bluffs, most of the men take the most southern ravine. Uh, some of the people don't, some of the troopers don't. If you look out there on the, uh, the bluffs, a couple of draws north of the ravine that most of the soldiers took, you'll see a couple of markers. And one of them is for uh, James D. Wolfe, who was one of the three surgeons for the 7th Cavalry. Uh, he took a route different than the other soldiers, got killed for it. Well, as Major Reno's men are ascending the bluffs, starting to consolidate, figure out what the hell happened, Benteen's men, Benteen's battalion, uh, comes up. Benteen's been given a note from Custer saying, come on, big village, be quick, bring packs, bring the ammunition packs, we're gonna need ammo. Benteen shows Reno this note. He tells Benteen, halt your command, I've lost half my men. And Benteen does. So aside from a brief foray, which we'll talk about in the later video, uh, Benteen assists in creating the defensive perimeter that the soldiers are going to occupy for the next two days. So the area that Benteen selects for the defense site, it's got a few areas that are higher than the surrounding terrain but there's also a lot of areas that are vulnerable to enemy fire, particularly from a ridge to the north, which gets named uh, Sharpshooter Ridge. Benteen's company, Company H, takes a, uh, uh, they occupy a ridge at the south of the position. The area overlooking the, the bluffs on the west side of the perimeter, that goes to Company B, who was guarding the pack train. The north part of the perimeter is occupied by companies M, D, and K. Lieutenant George Wallace, who's commanding Company G, he's told take his company, occupy a section of the perimeter. And Lieutenant Wallace tells Captain Benteen, I don't have a company. I have three men left. Benteen tells him, occupy your part of the perimeter. Take your three men. And Lieutenant Wallace and his men do that. And then the east side of the perimeter is occupied by Company A. Now the center of the perimeter has a, a shallow depression area. And all of the pack animals, everybody's horses, the mules, they're all put in that depression, along with the field hospital. Uh, there's one surviving surgeon right now, and uh, his name is Dr. Henry Porter, and he's going to be taking care of all the wounded. The spot where the hospital is, by no means a safe spot. Animals, men, they're gonna be shot throughout the entire two days, uh, right around the hospital. Bullets are gonna go through the, uh, a little tent fly that, it, that uh, Porter sets up. 
tough spot to be in. Now the troopers are going to spend the next two days holed up in this spot. Men are being uh, shot, men are being picked off. Through the, the rest of the, the evening of the 25th, 12 guys are going to get killed in this perimeter uh, with another 20 wounded. And the officers rapidly realize we can't keep this level of attrition going on. We're going we're gonna to get wiped out. So they start digging in. And this is a cavalry unit. They don't have shovels. They don't have spades. So they start digging in with whatever they've got. Cups, knives, uh, bare hands. Uh, they start bringing in uh, boxes, sacks of coffee beans, bacon, anything they can to, to shore up their defenses. Uh, everybody except... Captain Benteen. Uh, he figures with nightfall, the Indian village is going to leave and they're going to be in the clear. And that's not going to happen. So the rest of the battalion works through the night, shoring up their defenses. Benteen lets his men get a few hours of sleep. These guys have been up for about two days in the saddle, just fought a fight. Uh, they're tired. Benteen's tired. He lets his men sleep. Right as dawn breaks, the battle picks right up where it left off. Men are starting to get sniped again. Uh, digging into the ground for, for dear life. By all accounts, uh, Captain Benteen is just an inspiration. Uh, Major Reno's performance during this part of the fight, during the whole fight really, uh, he ain't doing any favors for himself, we'll put it that way. Uh, but Captain Benteen, the stories that people are telling about him, part of his boot heel gets shot off while he's trying to take a nap. He's inspiring men, walking up and down the line, just uh, nobody has a bad thing to say about him. One of the problems is, though, uh, Benteen didn't have his men fortified during the night. He let them rest, so his men are getting picked off. If Benteen's spot in the line uh, collapses, the rest of the unit's going to die. So the men quickly dig some rifle pits, and out there today, if you, if you go out to the, the battlefield today, underneath the prairie grass, you can see those rifle pits. You can see those embankments that, uh, that were dug almost 150 years ago. The Indians, especially on the south side of the, the perimeter, are getting real close. They're able to launch arrows into the position. Uh, they're throwing like rocks, uh, clods of dirt. Benteen knows if his part of the line folds, the rest of the perimeter is gonna fold too and everybody's gonna die. And he tells Major Reno, I'm gonna take Company M, we're gonna go charge on the south side. They uh, charge the Indians, uh, push the Indians back, and that action, saves the day on the south side. Uh, the Indians don't really pressure on the south side as much as they uh, were before. Uh, a couple of hours later, the companies on the north side do the same thing, and that's really what keeps them alive. The uh, other concern that comes up is water. Nobody has any, especially the wounded. The officers ask for volunteers. Uh, four men volunteer to draw enemy fire and act as sharpshooters and cover men who are gonna load up with canteens, pots, pans, whatever they got, run down to the river and get as much water as they can. There's a, a ravine, it's called Water Carriers Ravine. That's the access point that the soldiers used to get water for everyone. And a lot of those men, bunch of men who either drew enemy fire or ran down to get water, uh, they earned the Medal of Honor for uh, their actions and help save the command. By the afternoon of the 26th, uh, the Indian village is packed up and they're starting to move south away from the approaching uh, army forces under General Terry and Colonel Gibbon. They set fire to the, to the prairie and the soldiers who are corralled up on the bluffs, I mean, these are Civil War veterans, they're used to seeing groups of men, they can estimate, you know, large bodies of men. And they're astounded by how many uh, people were in this village, thousands, probably one of the biggest Indian villages uh, in the history of North America. And a couple of the troopers in their accounts, they, they relate that they couldn't help themselves. They gave three cheers for the Indians. The Indians fought a really good fight. Warriors salute other warriors. Throughout all the, the action on the 25th and the 26th, the one thing that everybody's talking about is, where's Custer at? Some people think he's corralled up on a hill, just like they are. Some people think he fought the Indians 
ran off to join General Terry's column. Uh, but nobody knows. Nobody's heard from him. Finally, on the morning of the 27th, they receive word uh, Custer and all of his men have been killed. And it blows their minds. Uh, the troopers, everybody there on the hilltop, thought that their fight was the, was the main fight, thought their fight was the real deal. And come to find out, it's a sideshow. It's not what people are going to remember. So if you're interested in learning more, I've got some other videos. I've got a playlist on the channel. Uh, feel free to check those out. If you got anything out of this video, feel free to leave a comment. And let me know what you think, and I will see you on the next video. Is that a good walk, Charlie? You have a good walk, bud?